Alrighty, well, good afternoon and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Andrew Daphne. I'm the Instruction and Outreach Librarian at the New Jersey State Library. It is my pleasure to present our speaker for today in conclusion of our Money Smart Week programming, Larry Metzler. Um, Larry is the president of Apogee Financial Services Group Incorporated, the law offices of Laurent W. Metzler, Innovative College Funding Solutions, LLC, and president of the Morristown, New Jersey Society for Financial Awareness. Uh, Larry's entire career has been focused exclusively on financial planning, college planning, estate planning, retirement planning, asset protection and wealth preservation planning, personal and business tax planning, and real estate matters. So thank you so much, Larry, for agreeing to talk to us today about how we might be able to sustain some income and the strategies to do that in, in retirement. Um, before we jump into Larry's presentation, I just have a few housekeeping items to go over. Uh, first and foremost, we will be taking your questions at the end of Larry's presentation today, but please feel free to submit them at any time using the Q&A or the chat feature in the Zoom dashboard. Um, Larry will be referring to a white paper um, in his presentation, and I will make sure that that gets uploaded to chat, and you'll be able to download that once the presentation gets underway. Um, there will be a survey available at the end of the webinar, so we ask if you have time, please complete the survey. Um, we always love hearing your feedback. And if you want more information about retirement strategies or maybe how they fit into your own um, personal retirement plan, you can contact Larry at his email address there or schedule an appointment at his Calendly link, and I will upload that to the chat as well. Um, one last thing before we jump in, I just wanna go over the Zoom dashboard. Um, this is what your dashboard should look like if you're using a PC or a Mac. If you're using a mobile device, the dashboard may look a little bit different, but all of the features will still be there. In the bottom left-hand corner, you will see your audio settings. You can check to make sure that your audio device is connected if you're using an external listening device, like a headset or earbuds in that area. At any point during the presentation, if you run into any issues, there is a raise hand button here. You can click on that and that'll alert me. I will send you a message in Zoom and hopefully be able to solve any problems that you are having. And as I mentioned, if you have any questions or wanna to contribute to the conversation, um, there's a Q&A and a chat button there. You can use either of those um, and we'll be able to, to address those questions at the end of Larry's presentation. So that is everything that I have for you. So it's my pleasure to turn it over to Larry now. All right, we finally got it up, folks. Well, welcome. Um, I have to sort of go through the disclaimers with you folks first. As Andrew has said, uh, this is uh, kind of a co-presentation uh, from SOFA. That's the Society for Financial Awareness and then uh, our, our for Apache Financial Services Group. Uh, we'll probably spend mm, 30 to 40 minutes on the actual presentation because I want to leave enough time at the end for your Q&A. If for any reason we run a little bit tighter and you do have questions that are not addressed, please feel free to reach out to me either by email or by telephone. I'd be more than happy to converse with you on any questions that you have. And there's no obviously no uh, charge for, for doing that. So SOFA basically uh, does not offer to sell financial products or to promote any one particular company, including ours. Uh, we may mention some specific financial instruments and their functionality in this presentation today. Uh, that does not enroll, uh, involve SOFAs uh, whatsoever. So this is their disclaimer to make sure that if anything uh, you know, were to occur, they're not going to be drawn into a conversation about endorsing any company, any firm, or any individual. So SOFA is a nationwide nonprofit educational speakers bureau. They're 501c3. That's the IRS designation of a um, nonprofit corporation. They've been around since 1993. Uh, their mission is to end financial illiteracy across America, one community at a time. So we're in our time. Contribute to that today, hopefully, for you folks. There is an evaluation form. Please, if you have time, fill that out. Uh, I'm more concerned about what you don't like versus what you do like. Nothing ever gets improved by, you know, telling everybody what they want to hear. All right. So 
let's get into this. Um, on the right hand side of your screen, successful retirement preparation planning. Uh, I'm going to spend a fair amount of time on this whole idea of planning. Um, they've done studies throughout the United States ever since I've been involved in this, this, this business over 40 years. And nothing has changed much with respect to their, the surveys indicate that people will spend more time, believe it or not, preparing for their vacation this year than they do the entirety of their lives planning for their retirement. As, as bizarre as that sounds, as ridiculous as that sounds, the reports keep coming back to, to support that proposition. Uh, hopefully, um, I, I can allay uh, your fears about retirement somewhat by getting you involved in planning from the very beginning. A plan is not something you have in your head. A plan is something objectively you can define, you can do what ifs about, meaning it is in your computer. Uh, it's something you spend time on on a, on a regular basis as your situation changes, uh, as your uh, careers change, so forth and so on. Fundamentally in planning is what's called a cash flow analysis or a budget. I'll use the word cash flow planning, not the word budget. Why? Budget has a very negative connotation for people. It's like a diet. You know, we're going to put you on a diet. Well, in your mind, what happens oftentimes is no one's going to tell you what to eat or not eat. Therefore, when we talk about planning, no one's going to tell you how to spend your money. The idea of a cash flow plan or a cash flow analysis focuses on you knowing where your money goes. I want to share with you a concept that someone gave to me about 20 years ago. It's called the black hole of lifestyle. What does that mean? It means that your black hole of lifestyle consumes all unallocated cash flow. By way of an example, you have a car loan, you paid that car loan off last month, that payment was $300 a month. If you don't allocate that 300 bucks into a savings program, it will be consumed. You won't know where it went, but it's gone. And that applies to anything that you're paying off, any debts that you have you're paying off. You have a credit card, you paid off $200 a month. If you don't capture that $200, into a savings plan somewhere, it's gone. Black hole of lifestyle. So let's talk about cash flow planning. Break it down into two categories. What do I have to spend or fixed expenses? What can I uh, choose to spend? Those are variable expenses. In the fixed side, initially, when you start this planning mode, put 10% away for yourself for retirement savings. Uh, contributions to your 403B, contributions to an IRA count in that category. If when you go through your categorization, you find out you don't have enough money at the end of the day, that means you're not saving anything other than what you're putting away in your 401k. I can tell you categorically, whatever you're putting away is not going to be sufficient to carry you through retirement. That's a big, ugly fact that we encounter all the time when we're going through our planning with our clients. Um on the bottom of the pyramid, if you will, there's a hierarchy of financial needs. The bottom part of the pyramid, emergency savings. COVID taught us that six months typically for a married couple is not enough. If one of them gets laid off or gets fired or gets sick, six months doesn't carry you through. So we're saying, you know, try to put away nine months if there's two people in a household, 12 months if it's only one of you. So that's the bottom part of the pyramid. And the bottom part of the pyramid also is life insurance. One or two times salary is not enough life insurance. When you're looking at life insurance planning, you need to do a capital needs analysis. It, take in, it takes into account the debts you have, provision of income for the surviving spouse, and if you, if you intend for your children to go through college, college planning. College planning of and by itself is a huge, huge budgetary issue. Are you plugging in long-term care planning in your budgeting? Question, yes or no. So those are some things from a standpoint of uh, bottom line uh, planning mode. Credit cards. If you're carrying a balance on your credit card after you establish your emergency fund, the first thing you should do before, before you've put money into your 401k is pay off your credit card debt. Your 401k is not earning 26 or 29% on an annual basis. That's the carrying cost typically for a credit card today. So that's that's step number number two, if you will, after you establish your emergency fund. Um, all right. So having said all that, um, you know, the old adage, if you planning, uh, uh, failure to plan equals planning to fail, that that's a very, 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 uh, appropriate, uh, long-term concept to keep in the back of your head. 
things you have to think about, we're going to deal with these one, one at a time as we progress through here. Longevity, people are living longer. Higher prices, meaning inflation. Uh, we're all familiar with inflation over the last 18 to 24 months. Prior to that, inflation was pretty quiet. Rising medical and long-term care costs, possible changes in Social Security, which we'll directly focus on, and then your investment risks. So life expectancy, according to data compiled, a man reaching 65 today can expect to live on average until 84 years old. So 19 years, if you will, if you retire at 65, you can do the math. When we do our planning for clients, we take, we take everyone out to age 100, that's like a, just to establish a worst case scenario. It's kind of you know interesting to see what that does. Most people don't plan to live 100. Uh, we have had clients uh, live to 102, 103 believe it or not. A woman reaching 65 today can expect to live on average until age 86.5. Um, so when you're doing your planning, unless you plan to die early, uh, you have to take into account normally a 20 year you know, life expectancy after retirement if, if 65 is your target date. After 65, uh, the averages go up. Uh, I, this, I, it's, it's like a magic number. Why on a mortality table? I don't know what, what that focus is, but after 65, 56% of the people will live to be age 83, 31% will live to be age 89, and 14% will live to be uh, 94. Those are, I believe, the 2010 mortality tables that they're referring to here. Inflation, when you're doing your calculations, uh, if we're using a 3% annual rate of inflation, in our planning, we're using 3.5 only because we've seen such a huge increase over the past you know, two years or so. Prior to that, we were using 2.25, which was the long-term uh, uh, inflation rate. So if we're using a 3% factor and you're earning $100,000 today, for your, for your retirement to last 20 years, you need to multiply that by 1.81%. Now we're talking about a cash burn of $180,000. If you're planning on living for 30 years, is 2.43. Those are pretty scary numbers, folks. Pretty scary numbers. Now, when you're looking at sort of your market basket for goods and services, the question kind of rises oftentimes is what is this 3%, you know, what is it applied to? One of the biggest factors, believe it or not, is the cost of gasoline. Your, your COLA and your Social Security, for example, that's what they use predominantly to determine the cost of living, cost of fuel. But, you know, a market basket for someone 20 years old is different from someone 65 and so forth, 30 versus 65, 40 versus 65. As we get older, uh, we're not buying new cars probably every three or four years. We're not, you know, consuming the same market basket. So in your planning, as you progress through this, keep in mind that the market basket and then the inflationary pressures on that market basket are going to be very, very diverse, depending on where you are in your life cycle. Huge, huge issue in both your retirement planning and your estate planning. I will tell you uh, probably one out of 10 or less people coming through my office to do estate planning have any form of long-term care coverage. Uh, and yet it's estimated that probably four out of 10 people will in fact require some form of long-term coverage, extended long-term coverage, not rehabilitation because I had a knee replaced or something like that. Some form of long-term care coverage uh, during their lifetime. Here's the ugly truth. Uh, $25 and 46 cents an hour for home, homemaker services. That's not someone taking care of the person. That's someone cooking, cleaning, so forth and so on. 26 an hour on average for home health care. 53 for adult daycare, health care center. $4,300 a month for assisted living and $77.56 in a semi-private room, $69.65 private room in a nursing home. Uh, folks, I don't know where these numbers are coming from. I can tell you categorically because I deal with this daily. The cost for someone in an independent living facility today uh, is about 15000 bucks a month. Home care runs about $6,000 a month. So this is an amalgamation of if I'm living in Kentucky, maybe these numbers are okay. But if I'm living in New Jersey, they are way, way underestimated. Uh, look at the bottom part of the screen. Healthcare costs are going up at a rate of about 6.2%. And if you've driven around, you know that they're building nursing homes 
and uh, adult care facilities all over the place. They're going up like, you know, CVS pharmacies. So that tells you a little bit about what the expectation is going forward in time. Do not fail to address this in your planning. It is, is an issue that we're all going to have to deal with sooner or later. Change in Social Security. Uh, the estimates are by 2033, the, uh, the um, ability to pay out will be reduced to about 70 cents versus the dollar today. Uh, pay particular attention about how your politicians, how your congressmen and senators are dealing with this issue. Uh, it's a hot potato issue. It always comes up on the budget. Some folks want to have it reevaluated every five years. Um, if it's going to be depleted or start to be depleted by 2033, which is is the factual representation, at least from uh, from the uh, what I can read, uh, what changes are proposed that are more likely than not to be imposed? Uh, you've seen it in your paycheck. They are increasing the threshold upon which Social Security is withheld. It's been going up every year for the last 10, 15 years. So fully expect that, that will continue. Uh, so there are some proposals to uncap it, meaning if you make more than the current threshold, let's say you make 200,000 bucks a year, $300,000 a year, you're going to pay it all the way up. I have no problem with that. Most people on the call are probably not making 300 grand or 200 grand. So, uh, you know, if you're making a boatload of money, why shouldn't you pay into the system like everybody else? So that's one thing I think will continue. Second thing is, is increasing retirement age. So if, if you're relatively young on the call here today, uh, I would fully expect that, um, the retirement age may be increased to age 70 or possibly 72 as we progress through this. Um, there's no other way to, to keep the fund um, maintained uh, other than addressing those issues. You probably know or don't know that Social Security was never designed to pay um, disability benefits. It was strictly retirement. And a larger proportion of the fund typically goes out now for um, disability, Medicaid, things like that, than were initially established. So that's what's depleting the fund quicker than they had established. Also, some suggestions to privatize it, which I think would be a big mistake. I don't know how you folks feel about that, but uh, anything to do with these these types of issues, uh, get a handle on, on on how your congressmen and your senators are voting on this stuff. And you know, to the extent that they're not voting the way you think they should, put some pressure on them because that's the only way we we get changes done in this country. Income tax rates, uh, as you can see, well, we're probably half of what the highest rates used to be back in the 60s. Um, I remember when I first started in this business, uh, it, tax rates were 50% on earned income and up to 80% or 20% surcharge, if you will, uh, on uh, unearned income. So they were taxing your interest and your dividends on top of your, your marginal tax rate. Um, Marginal tax rate is defined on the, the tax you pay on your last dollar of income versus your actual tax bracket, which is you know the tax you paid uh, divided by your income. Most of us are probably in an actual tax bracket between 15 to 25 percent. Um, some folks um, have some interesting um, views on taxes. You know, I, I oftentimes when I'm I'm sitting down with my clients initially. You ask them, so do you think you're being a lower tax bracket or a higher tax bracket when you retire? Most of them say lower. Uh, in, in, in fact, that's, that's probably not accurate for most folks. They're actually in a higher tax bracket because they've lost all their deductions and so forth. Plus all their retirement benefits now are taxes on your income, you know, your 401 or your 403B, whatever the case may be. Your IRAs are coming out fully taxable. Um, the other, other, other question is, is more of a philosophical you know, the more taxes you pay, that means the more income you made. So would you rather, would you rather be in a 30% tax bracket or a 0% tax bracket, everything else being equal? Obviously, you're making more money if you're paying more in taxes. So that's the, the income reality of it or the tax reality of it. Will tax rates go up? Um, depends on what happens really from the standpoint of how the, 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 the budget deficits being addressed um, so we'll have to sit tight and see what happens with that. I mean, it's a, a poison pill for any administration to increase taxes, but we'll have to wait and see what happens. Business risk and interest rates. 
stock market in general, stocks should be considered long-term investments. Absolutely. Uh, you know, the idea of speculation, you, you can't outthink the market. You may in the short term, but in the long term, it always comes about to bite you. Crypto, I'm not a big fan of crypto. Uh, if it's not regulated, you can't control what happens to it. So again, this is personal observations here. Uh, buying bonds, interest rates affect bond prices. I think you've seen what, what's happened with, with these bank failures where these banks were going long on, on, on low interest rate bonds and could satisfy their reserve issues when they had you know, people coming and say, give me my cash. So the, the idea of uh, bonds being safe, there are a number of uh, papers being written recently about bonds may in fact, and I, I share in this philosophy, may be more volatile right now than the stock market. Um, observation, um, if you're a sector investor, um, pay particular attention to what's happening with China. So thinking, you know, the, 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 the confrontations are heating up over there. Um, some people think we'll be at war with China in the next two years. Even if we're not, you know, the political uh, adversarial relationships is not getting any better. So how does that shake down into how you invest your money? Uh, if I'm investing in anything that's chip dependent, you know, as you probably know, 90% of the chips come out of Taiwan. You know, we are in the process of building chip manufacturing companies here. But if you're in a sector that basically is chip dependent, like high tech or automobile industries or things like that, you might want to think in terms of pairing that back a little bit, again, dependent upon your view of what's happening in the political arena. Um the idea of balancing your portfolio dependent upon where you are in your life cycle conceptually makes all the sense in the world. But if, if you have a need of X number of dollars a month and you're, you're, you're minus X when you do your planning, oftentimes that's suggestive of I have to be more aggressive in the marketplace. Um, that typically leads to disaster. If you're lucky enough on the call to have a pension, Congratulations, you got a, a gold ticket, as I call it. Uh, I have a lot of times people coming in. For example, I had two teachers coming in about, oh God, two months ago. And they were very apologetic and they didn't have a big asset base. But they had a pension. One, one was getting about 65000 a year. The other was getting, I think, around forty five or fifty a year. Folks, if you're getting a pension of $50,000 on a risk-free rate of return of 5%, that's the equivalent of having a million bucks in the bank generating that money for the rest of your life. It is a gold ticket. Same thing applies to Social Security. Your Social Security is probably the only asset that you will ever own that has a COLA attached to it, cost of living adjustment to it that you can't outlive. So the idea of having these guaranteed sources of income to the extent that you can match your consumption to your guaranteed sources of income takes a tremendous amount of pressure off of your investment determinations because you've got your nut, you're not covered each month. To the extent you don't have a pension, the idea of balancing out your risk and the return on the portfolio becomes much, much, much more important. So let's talk about the relationship between bond prices and interest rates. As you know, Fed has basically increased the rates uh, over the last several months to deal with inflation. And I think they overshot the runway, quite frankly, but that's just my opinion. You do not ever want to be long, long, meaning, well, let me back up three steps. So uh, a short-term investment in a bond is zero to five years. Intermediate, five to 20, long, 20 to 30. You don't want to be long in rising interest rate environments. Why? Because the bond that comes out tomorrow with a half, 50 basis points, a half a percentage point higher than the bond you own now, that bond's going to lose value. Most of you will not own individual bonds. You're investing in a bond fund. And if you look at what's happened to bond mutual funds recently, they have gotten devastated. Devastated. Because again, every every 50 point, 25 point basis increase in a prevailing rate against your bond portfolio uh, erodes the value of that bond portfolio. So 
I, I would encourage you to the extent that you can, if you can buy an individual bond in your in your personal portfolio, and the idea there is, is I'm going to collect the interest and I'm going to redeem the bond at par, uh, that's great. Be very, very, very careful investing in bond mutual funds. You want to know, A, what is the duration or what is the maturity of that, the average duration of that portfolio? And then again, if it play that back against, is it a long-term maturity against rising interest rates or a short-term maturity? The inverse is true. If I'm currently owning a bond right now with a 5% coupon on it and interest rates are going down, that bond's going to appreciate in value. So I want to be long when rates are going down. I want to be short when rates are going up. Larry, I, can, I, I okay, I'm scared now. I don't want to invest in a bond mutual fund. Where can I put my money? Um, believe it or not, uh, 11 month CDs right now are yielding four, three, four, four percent. Um, Schwab uh, uh, Advantage Money Market Fund is yielding 4.63% on cash. So if you've got money sitting in a savings account somewhere or you know a CD somewhere, check your rates and see if it makes sense maybe to move that money into a more high, high yielding um, vehicle as opposed to investing in bond funds. Again, I'm very, very concerned about the idea of losing value in your bond fund portfolio. Okay, so long, long term, get a plan, figure out what you need to live on versus you choose to live on. And I'll share some, some, some actual experiences for me post COVID. Sometimes we take for granted, we don't identify sources of savings. Prior to COVID, there's a restaurant literally 50 yards behind my office. And every day I and my staff would go to lunch. And we would spend for an average meal, 15 to 20 bucks a day, hundred bucks a week, 400 bucks a month, almost five grand at the end of the year. Here comes COVID. Start packing my lunch. Guess what? I haven't gone back. Used to go to Starbucks coffee, two bucks a cup. You know what we do now? We have a, we have a uh, coffee maker, uh, a little, little tray. I, I buy a bag of ground Starbucks coffee. We make coffee here. That's two bucks a day, sometimes four bucks a day, times the number of days, times the month. If you start looking at how you spend your money more, uh, more intensely, you can always find ways of saving more money. So those are just a uh, new car. I, I, I bought two new cars in my entire life. I still have both of them. I don't buy new cars. I buy, you know, high end used cars. Why? Because of the depreciation that takes place. Um, Managing risk, managing the risk is nothing more than trying to balance out your, your equity portfolio versus your cash versus your fixed income investments. Specific risks really risks for really dealing with how you subcategorize your, your asset bases. Um, again, addressing the political risk associated with those portfolios, uh, sector rotation, so forth and so on. Roth IRA is a tax strategy. Yes, anything you can do to reduce the taxes on your future income is going to pay off huge dividends in the future. Uh, sources of income, uh, early retirement, part-time, full-time work. Uh, if you are into home improvement like I am, you go to your Lowe's store, your, your uh, Home Depot stores, and you see retirees in there. Uh, you go to McDonald's sometimes, you see retirees in there. They're supplementing their income. Why? Because they didn't plan it properly enough for their retirement and have to work part-time. Nothing wrong with working part-time or even full-time after you retire, quote-unquote. Part of the preparation for retirement, I have found, this is especially true to men. Ladies, please don't get mad at me. A lot of times men psychologically associate who they are with their job title. And then when they retire and they no longer have a job title, it creates real real time problems, which has nothing to do with finances, has to do with psychology. So keep in, keep in mind the psychological aspects of retirement as well. Later in retirement, you're going to be withdrawing from your IRA starting at 72. You have no choice in that matter. Uh, early retirement pension income, once again, golden ticket. Uh, real estate investments, if you want to, if you can handle being a landlord, it's a great source of income. If you start it early enough where it makes sense, where there's no debt on the property when you retire, so now it's just a uh, adjunct uh, income flow to you. 
Social Security, obviously, um, guaranteed income, and then your 401k withdrawals, much like your uh, IRAs, mandatory distributions. What's an appropriate or a, a long-term sustainable withdrawal rate? Back in the day when the rule of thumb was I could get 5% in a five-year CD at any bank, 5% withdrawal rate was something we would use automatically. The current WAGs basically are suggesting 4% is what you should be using. The white paper that uh, Andrew addressed is a very, very interesting statistical study of, of the basis of that. Uh, I would say, again, uh, unless interest rates return after, after this inflationary uh, pressure is relieved, if interest rates don't return back to, to a 5% normalized rate, I would use three and a half to four max, nothing more than that. Uh, very, very important not to overshoot the runway as far as your, your expectation of what your uh, portfolio is going to generate by way of income when you retire. Bucket approach, simply, simply you're dividing your, your investments into, into short, intermediate, and long-term investments. Your short-term investments basically are your current cash flow needs, your emergency funds, so forth and so on. What's an appropriate uh, bucket allocation here? Cash, CDs, short-term bonds, uh, immediate annuities, social security, pension income, and your wages. Um, Midterm bucket, mix of growth and income, uh, replenish your short-term if you, for any reason, drew down on your emergency fund or, or anything like that. Uh, appropriate investments, bonds, once again, make a determination whether what the maturity should be in that bond or that bond fund. Uh, tax deferred annuities, uh, absolute return funds. I've never seen that term before in my entire life. I'm not sure there is such a thing unless they're talking about, uh, you know, an, a, uh, a fixed uh, a fixed bond fund or something like that. Asset allocation funds, balance funds. Um, a lot of times it's appropriate to maybe look into a target dated fund, which typically the allocation shifts if you're 20 into probably, you know, 95% equities. If you're 60, it's going to be 90% 90, 90 fixed income. The only problem with them is, once again, um, where are the markets at the time these target target uh, dated funds are allocated? You know, imagine being 90% in bonds 18 months ago. That that was that was your retirement portfolio. You would be devastated right now. Long-term income bucket, inflation head, longevity, obviously, growth stocks uh, or growth funds. I'll also plug in this idea of um, uh, ETFs or exchange traded funds, uh, real estate investments and commodities. Commodities for most folks are really kind of high end options. I don't typically advocate, you know, that source of, of uh, investments. Once again, crypto, um, people have varying feelings about that. You know, all you hear about is the people who invested a hundred bucks. Now it's worth a hundred thousand dollars. Yep. As long as you can get your money out. Uh, we'll have to see what happens with crypto. Um, closing thoughts, successful strategy will give you sustainable income to retire in a lifestyle you desire. It's essential to prepare for certain and uncertain risks. Now, retirement strategies will continue to evolve. That's, that's an understatement. Once again, I'm going to rotate you back to where we started from. If you take anything at all home from this presentation today, please put a plan together. Be realistic about how you spend your money. If you don't really know how to spend, how you spend your money, most I'll tell you, most people do not. Uh, keep a diary for a month and put down every dollar you spend and put it into the category. This is I have I have to spend this amount of money. I choose to spend that amount of money. Uh, it's the only way you get control over it. If you are in credit card debt. Uh, there are strategies to snowball the debt. That's another, another presentation. If you want to know how that works, give me a call or shoot me a, a line. I'm a, more than happy to tell you what we do with our clients. Uh, and that's about it, folks. All right. Thank you so much, Larry. Um, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to um, either put them in the Q&A or the chat, um, and we'll be happy to address them. All right. Uh, first question. Um, I have a pension and when I retire, are we bringing home more in the pension and social security than what I make now while working? 
Um, I have substantial deferred comps and 401ks. Is there any amount I should be removing yearly, even if I don't need it? That's a financial question, a great, a great question. What you should be looking at there uh, is, is this idea of tax harvesting, which is basically uh, figuring where where you are in your in your marginal tax bracket, because presumption here is you're going to be in a higher tax bracket when you retire. So let's say um, there is between you're in a 20 percent tax bracket and the next tax bracket is 22 and you have a ten thousand um, um, dollar window there. The idea there would be to convert about nine thousand five hundred dollars of that uh, IRA or 401k money into a Roth. Next year, we look at it again. Let's say next year, you got a $20,000 space between your current origin tax bracket and your next one. You would convert that much that year. So that over time, you're converting what will, what will be taxable forever in the future at your margin tax bracket and retirement into non-taxable income going forward in time. Tax harvesting. Does that answer the question? I hope. <laughs> I uh, says, so, so convert my deferred compensation to 401ks. I think you you would convert some of that to Roth IRAs is what you're saying, correct? I would no, I would be looking at the 401k money or the deferred comp. Typically, uh, you can't do much with that until you actually take it. Um, and once you take it, typically it's a lump sum distribution and you get taxed on it, as I understand it. Now, it, it may be a different hybrid plan. Um uh, but let's say that you have um, money in your 401k that you have the ability to withdraw. Uh, you would convert some of that to a Roth as opposed to rolling it into a traditional IRA, you would convert it to a Roth IRA. Yeah, that answers the question. Um, do you have any recommendations for somebody who is struggling to get by right now, maybe living paycheck to paycheck? How can they start building up to? Yeah, um, absolutely. I, I, and again, Andrew, this is absolutely fundamental. You need to get control of where your money's going. Um, paycheck to paycheck may be nothing more than, geez, I have too many fixed expenses. But I, I will tell you, I've been doing this for so long. Typically, if you really sit down and, 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 and track every dollar you spend, you have some flex there. You know, uh, for example, you know, where do you eat lunch? You know, if you go to McDonald's every day and I, I go there every once in a while, it's 11 bucks for a meal. I, I can make a sandwich for probably a buck and bring it to work and eat it at work. Well, I don't want to eat it. Well, okay, you don't want to eat your sandwich at work, but do you want to save money? I mean, it really comes down to decision making. And that's just a very, very kind of simplistic example of how we can, you know, uh, capture more of our money. I would say also is, is, is part and parcel of that paycheck to paycheck. Is there credit card debt involved there? If so, then that's a, that's a conversation we should have. How to get how to get out of debt? Uh, you mentioned something about snowballing credit card debt. Can you yes. explain that more? Sure. So, I've got three credit cards, uh, and I'm making minimum payments uh, on them um, on two of them, but I'm throwing an extra fifty hundred bucks on the biggest one or the one with the highest interest rate. What you need to do in that instance is to say, okay, of these credit cards that I have, which one has the smallest balance, irrespective of the of the of the interest rate? Pay minimum amount. Well, first thing you should do is if you got credit card debt, do not contribute to your 401k. So whatever's going to because 401k is not earning 26% a year. So take the money here to for you, putting your 401k. Take that plus any excess you're paying on, on the cards each month, pay that first one off. So let's say that's a hundred bucks a month on that, on the on the lowest balance that you have. So now once I pay that off, I have a hundred bucks a month I can I can pay to the next shortest one. 
And let's say that's a hundred bucks a month. So I pay the first one off. I take the hundred bucks a month I was paying on number three, apply to what I was paying on number two, plus my normal payment on number two, pay that one off. And let's say that's a hundred bucks. Pay the first two off. Now I've got 200 bucks available to pay off number three. Once number three is paid off, the totality of what I've been paying on all three of these cards now from, from the first day goes into a savings account or, or some separate account other than my daily checking account. It's counterintuitive. What people do is they try to hit the highest interest rate one first with a couple extra bucks and they never get out of debt. Again, same thing applies to any other thing you're paying off. You know, I, I got a Best Buy. I bought a big screen TV. I'm paying 50 bucks a month. Okay, pay that off. That 50 bucks a month goes into a savings account. The car payments, 300 bucks a month. I pay it off in two months. Month three, 300 bucks goes into a savings account. You got to capture it. Black hole of lifestyle. If you don't, you will spend it. Trust me. Uh, somebody said that's how I got out of credit card debt. Did it quickly. So absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> and it's a feel-good exercise. It really is. Same thing applies. It again, depending on your, let's say your mortgage, your mortgage rate, right? If you have a high mortgage rate, uh, look at what your actual interest payment is the first three or four years and make a couple extra payments and watch what happens to the total interest you pay. Typically, if you if you accelerate your mortgage, and just pay the interest extra, you pay off a 30-year mortgage in about 13 to 14 years. By just paying the extra interest on your amortization table each month. Um, you mentioned concerns about social security. Can we rely on that as a sustainable form of income? I would, if it were me, uh, I would take whatever your projection is now and take about 70% of that and use that as your, as your basis in your planning. I think that would be, again, depending on your age, how old is this person? Um, they're 54. 54, I'd say you're good to go. Yeah, I think you'd be fine. If I'm 34, I, I would reduce my, my projections. I don't see any more questions. Um, so I think we can go ahead and end it there. Is there anything you would like to close with, Larry? Uh, well, anybody who has, you know, who doesn't want to raise an issue now or a question now, feel free. Please call us. Uh, give, you know, we're we're here for you guys. Um, again, complimentary. If, if you have an issue that you don't want to talk about specifically or detailed enough, uh, the question about the deferred comp is very, very fact based, fact sensitive. So if that person, you know, if you want to give me a call, we can talk about it with more detail. I'd be more than happy to do that with you. Complimentary basis. Well, I'd like to thank you again, Larry, for for coming back and presenting for for the library. Um, and I'd like to thank everybody for, for attending today. Um, and hopefully you found it informative and can take some things home with you um, as you move forward in your retirement planning. So um, if any, again, if anybody does have any other questions or anything, I put Larry's email and his um, meeting link in the chat so you can grab it from there. Um, this program was recorded, so I will be emailing out to everybody who registered. So look out for that um, as well. And uh, we thank you for joining us and everybody be safe, be well, and hopefully we'll see you soon. Thanks, folks. Have a good one. Thank you very much.